Hello, everyone. Welcome to Digital Fridays. This is our third Digital Fridays that will be running all the way until the end of the summer. My name is Adashima Oyo. I'm going to introduce Raymond Pond, and then he's going to introduce his two co-facilitators. So we're very excited that you're joining us. And I just want to remind you that you can also type in any sort of questions or comments that you have. And at the end of this uh, presentation, we will take all of your questions and answers. So I want to start by giving a, a brief um, introduction to Raymond Pind, who is a doctoral candidate in educational leadership at California State University. And he is also an, an instruction and research librarian at Alder Graduate School of Education. In addition, Raymond is a Haystack Scholar. He has been a Haystack Scholar since 2017, and his research interests include information literacy, digital engagement, and humanities work. So Raymond, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Adashima. I really appreciate you um, helping and facilitating this part, um, and thank you all for joining. Really pleased to have this webinar um, focusing on Asia and Pacific and with that being digital scholarship and digital humanities. I am really pleased for our um, two uh, esteemed speakers, uh, colleagues I know. So this is uh, for a preface here. People might assume this might be sort of like a, a library focus. Actually, it's, it's quite broad. Uh, we, we want to um, emphasize that there are a lot of opportunities to collaborate with libraries in terms of digital humanities, scholarship services, and there's a lot of potential there. And so our two um, speakers will be discussing basically their uh, experiences with this um, area. So I just um, wanted to emphasize a little bit here. This is um, part of the Haystack um, program. So Haystack is the humanities, um, I, I always forget, it's like a really long arts uh, technology uh, group. And it's really a great opportunity and for those of you who are graduate students, uh, please consider looking into the Haystack Scholars Program. It's open every year, and it's basically an opportunity to learn more about the DH world, uh, some of the upcoming trends and services, and then you, as a scholar, would be able to um, bring back some of these opportunities into like a webinar, like this uh, program that I'm talking about today. And so um, before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to ask everyone here if you could type in the chat box where you're from or where you are right now, that would be great. So we can just see where everyone is coming from. So I'll give it, give everyone like a minute here. Wow, we have folks from Berlin, San Diego, Indianapolis, Toronto, Chapel Hill, Seoul, currently in Boston, California, New York, New York City, Napa. Very, very cool. Berkeley, Riverside. Oh, a lot of California folks. Um, I think we are um, having a, a really diverse international group. That's really excellent. And hopefully all of you uh, will be able to um, take back some of the, the ideas that we're going to share and some of the really great conversations we're going to have. This is really meant to be a, sort of like a semi roundtable, informal-ish kind of talk we want to invite also all of you to participate in the chat box as well. If you have any ideas concerning um, the questions we're going to ask, it's um, rather a, a great way to hear different ideas from one another. So first I want to introduce our speakers. We have uh, two speakers here on the left, Hai Peng Lee. He is currently the university librarian at University of California, Merced, since uh, June of 2015 with Min Cho on the right and Shu Han Rebecca Wong uh, from Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, they are all co-editors of the newest publication, Digital Humanities and Scholarly Research Trends in Asia and Pacific, published by IGI Global 2019. So I should um, introduce our other speaker, uh, Dr. Min Cho on the right. She is an associate professor, web coordinator at the New Jersey City University Library. Um, along with the other two uh, editors. She uh, has worked on this book as well. And I should preface that um, for my role, I actually had the opportunity to review two of the chapters for the book. And it was a great opportunity to see what uh, they're doing in Taiwan and what they're doing in Japan. So with that, I will um, give them both an opportunity to give you some context of the book, and then we'll dive into the questions. Um, so here you go. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I'll start. Um, Hai Peng Li, I'm the uh, University Librarian uh, at UCMSA. <clears throat> um, 
I'm really pleased to have this opportunity. So thank you uh, for uh, sponsoring this uh, webinar. And um, um, I just want to say that, um, as you know, anytime you're into sort of research and you're trying to publish a book, you know, a lot of work <laughs> has, gone, has to take place. And I really appreciate the support from um, uh, our community and um, particularly our other uh, editor, Rebecca Wong, uh, who's actually not here because she, she lives in, in, in Hong Kong. She's probably sound asleep right now. Um, but um, Min and Rebecca and me, the three of us, um, are actually the three co-editors uh, for this book. And uh, just a little bit about the context uh, of the book. Uh, some of you, um, well, I don't know if you know that um, I've been working uh, mostly in the U.S., um, in um, Arizona, in Ohio, uh, in New Jersey, and then I took a job in Hong Kong uh, in 2011. So I worked at Hong Kong Baptist University for four years. And Rebecca worked with me. She was uh, my head of uh, digital and multimedia services. So while I was there, we um, started looking at some of these uh, uh, digital humanities related projects in Hong Kong and elsewhere in the region. And so um, we came up um, with a actually a chapter uh, in a book uh, focusing on digital humanities in Hong Kong. So we did a survey and we came up with some findings there. So if anybody is interested, I'll be happy to send you uh, the, the link to that. But um, that gotched our interest in this area. And as we uh, progressed, uh, of course, um, we were um, taking some initiatives and in some ways leadership role um, in Hong Kong to push digital humanities forward. Um, so since I came back, you know, um, to the US, I'm still interested in it. And um, that's how um, we started thinking about maybe a sort of pulling together a book of this sort. And I have to say there are, there are you know, um, in the monograph uh, kind of format, um, any publications related to digital humanities is, is so scarce, uh, particularly in Asia. Um, so uh, our book, I think, serves as a sort of introductory kind of uh, uh, overview of what's happening in that part of the world, um, particularly in East Asia. And um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Min and, and let her talk about her uh, situation. Min? Maybe Min's on mute. She... Oh, are you? Hello. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for reminding me. I have some computer problem today. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Ming Chao. Uh, thank, first of all, I want to thank Ray Pong for inviting me and Hai Pon uh, to talk with everyone. Um, I uh, actually studied uh, educational technology leadership in a doctoral program uh, several years ago. So I have always followed uh, the techn technology uh, transformation in the past uh, and mm -hmm. also reviewed many uh, uh, trends. So, uh, and also I'm, it's, it's exciting to see all those new tools for data mining, data visualization, 3D modeling, et cetera, and virtual reality and in augmented reality. And then the web two technology platforms, uh, I have seen those, we have all seen those uh, that uh, they have enabled humanities and, and, and social science scholars to gain deeper insights into information. So all these have transformed the teaching, learning, research to be uh, more collaborative and cross-disciplinary. So, I am really pleased to have the opportunity to join Rebecca uh, and Haipon in this book uh, project. So this book was actually written by scholars and practitioners who are, are experts in digital humanities across Asian Pacific. It provides uh, 
uh, insights into recent development and uh, trends in digital humanities and scholarship in Asian Pacific. Uh, Asian Pacific. So it has it has case studies and analysis of valuable uh, projects and initiatives and demonstrates how uh, they have facilitated academic exchanges and preservation of cultural uh, heritage. As a librarian, I am uh, particularly pleased to see that academic libra uh, libraries and librarians participated uh, in and also contributed to some meaningful projects to help manage and sustain uh, to sustain the development of uh, digital humanities in their institutions. Uh, each chapter actually uh, is quite unique in its international perspective and also uh, they are insightful, uh, both theoretical and uh, practical uh, in their viewpoints. So I am very pleased and I uh, hope to have a very uh, thoughtful, uh, pleasant conversation with all of you and actually to learn more. And I don't know how many of you have to actually have read the book. Um, it just came out, you know, in January of this year. <clears throat> so, um, you know, you know, sort of like a ebook format. Um, and uh, if you have, and you have seen the, you know, the the table of contents on the screen, uh, basically the two sections. Uh, one is kind of uh, sort of by region or country. Um, as you can see, um, they're all listed here, you know, Australia, uh, Hong Kong, and Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and so on and so forth. And the second uh, section deals mostly with specific projects, and they're kind of <clears throat> from the perspective of case studies. So um, as Min said, you know, there, it covers a wide range of issues and topics, um, but also um, regions and countries. Um, so it, it's, it's a very uh, interesting, uh, reaching experience to be working with these uh, authors and sort of getting and learning uh, really what's going on in their respective parts of the world. So this is Ray again, and I have actually a question as I'm looking at the table of content and hearing you both um, talking about it. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are digital humanities projects about Asia and the Pacific regions that are not generate, obviously that are not created or, or managed in Asia and Pacific? And I'm just wondering if that was something you had discussed to include or not in to include, or did you really want to focus on the perspective from Asia and Pacific? I can take a step at that. Um, I think we, we did want to focus on the Asia Pacific uh, because we feel like uh, that was a gap. Um, you know, there is so much being written in other parts of the world, but in Asia, there's really um, not much written from the perspective of a sort of like a overarching kind of perspective to look at digital humanities in this area, um, in, in this part of the world. And uh, there are certainly, as you can see from the table of contents, there are certainly uh, countries or regions that are not represented here. And part of that was, um, for example, we did receive submissions from India and uh, from China. Uh, these submissions were not, uh, not up to the standards. Um, uh, the qualities were just not as, um, as good and the reviewers did not recommend them. So that's why uh, some of them were just poorly written. Um, you know, we wish we had uh, high quality, higher quality um, submissions for those areas uh, and regions, but we didn't, you know, we just um, didn't get those. Yeah, and also I think uh, there, uh, the, the language, uh, the book wo uh, was published in English language and also uh, each chapter has to be uh, of certain length. 
Uh, so it also, uh, it's quite demanding. Uh, we, we, we really wished that uh, uh, some uh, of the countries, especially the uh, article from China and also in India, we, we tried to uh, uh, help them to, uh, you know, to put, put to, 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 to move, uh, to, to be included, but it just didn't work in the end. It's, uh, uh, but still, we I think we still learned some uh, from them. Uh, whatever information they uh, provided, and also uh, they are very helpful. But we are pleased to have the representation of uh, many uh, countries and regions uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, they have been represented. So if if uh, you can look into section one, um, mm -hmm. and they're they're pretty broad. What kind of I guess common themes that bring them all together, or just in general, the book, with all the submissions you received, was there any common themes? Well, you know, we wanted to cast it as broad as possible because we wanted to address um, pretty much almost every aspect of digital humanities research in the region. So we, we didn't really focus on any particular area or any particular theme because the title of the book, as you can you can see it's digital humanities and scholarly research trends in the Asia Pacific. So it's really talking about, you know, what's trendy in, in, in this area of research uh, in this region. Um, and that's a, that was our intention. Uh, we didn't want to limit it to a particular area or a particular aspect um, of digital humanities. Yeah, it is, uh... Uh, you know, I have uh, involved in, in IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, uh, a lot. And I quite often uh, went to their knowledge management section and, and other uh, working groups. Uh, I, I met authors and some presenters from all over the world, including uh, those, those uh, scholars from our librarians and scholars from uh, Asian countries, uh, and uh, they talked about digital humanities. But I haven't seen something which is overarching, give, give us a very uh, good kind of environmental scan of the region uh, to see how, what they are doing, where, that, where they are, and uh, um, the, uh, in, uh, the, the kind of information. And we really haven't uh, limited to the specifics uh, for the book, uh, uh, but then we can see we have some overviews of different countries in the first chapter. And also we have uh, individual case studies and also including one article, which is very uh, thought provoking uh, and uh, theoretical. It's really uh, the, the, the author is an artist, also a scholar uh, from Australia, a Tasmanian artist. And she also uh, teaches uh, art, actually, in Singapore National University. From her unique experience, she really uh, delved into very theoretical uh, part of digital humanity, which is also very thought-provoking and interesting uh, in this book. That, that one, I think, is very unique. Uh, oh, that yeah. That's really great because I was going to ask you um, before we move on to the actual questions. What was the most unique in your opinion? I mean, all of them are pretty unique. <laughs> like chapter five for you, Min. Uh, it's very hard to say. <laughs> chapter <laughs> digital humanities in Singapore. Uh, the artist. Actually, uh, the artist is uh, she is uh, from I, uh, which chapter? I think the chapter uh, performing. Uh, the internet, chapter 10. Chapter she 10. is a, a yeah, Tasmanian artist and also scholar. Uh, very uh, deep theories, cultural theories, talking to consideration and think about uh, digital humani humanities, uh, how would that uh, affect uh, the way that the, the, the art uh, in the future can be presented and repurposed and how internet, uh, the software part, uh, will uh, play uh, 
and and how、uh, the government、uh, and the censorship will also、uh, affect the development of digital humanities in the future. And the the the, the area that people probably、uh, haven't really、uh, looked so much deep into、uh, this aspect. I find it、uh, it's amazing. It's not an easy chapter to read. I have to say. <laughs> Um, what about、uh, what about you, Hai Pang?、Um, certainly, you know you can sort of see.、Um, you know, I, I was fascinated by the various kinds of projects that are happening, that have happened, or are happening <clears throat> in this whole region. They're they're so diverse. I think just the diversity of the kinds of digital humanities projects in this region. I think that's that's just、um, really、uh, really amazing. Um, and then seeing, so we're sort of getting into the, the maybe um, um, digressing a little bit, but、um, you know,、um, looking at the future、uh, of digital humanities,、uh, it's it's、uh, extremely encouraging. Well, th thank you for sharing that. Those are really great responses. And as they were saying, if you're looking into the future, you have to look at the past too, right, to see、mm -hmm. how. Humanities computing is heading, or how it developed over time. So this is a little bit different. This is the、um, questions we actually had prepared in advance,、um, just for conversations purposes. And for those who are in the、um, audience,、uh, you're welcome to type in the chat box, you know, your responses to this question as well, since many folks bring in really great、um, ideas, contributions, experiences. So first, I'd like to ask for our.、Um, a, a, Presenters here, from your experience, where is DH he,、uh, DH heading is in Asia, as you both、uh, I think alluded to. So maybe we'll start with Min. Okay, yeah. When I read the chapters,、uh, I I think usually some of the chapters、uh, in Asia, like in Japan, in、uh, Taiwan, and also uh, Korea, uh, in the uh, North. Uh, so, I'm sorry. South Korea,、uh, these authors they talk about development. They start with、uh, they always think that the early form of digital humanities is digitization.、Uh, that, of course,、uh, took us many many years ago, decades ago, right?、Uh, and then they thought just about ten years ago, and it's just、uh, changed to a, a new direction.、Uh, it more、uh, focus on scholarship.、Uh, More、uh, about creating contents,、uh, more about cross-disciplinary study and projects, etc.、Um, it's quite interesting because in, in the beginning, it's just digitization. The li as librarians, we all know <laughs> the library uh, took uh, part, uh, took part, uh, part uh, in those projects、uh, to create databases to increase、uh, access and preservation, etc.、Uh, But now it's a it's a very different ball game, I think. Yeah, I I totally agree. I I think、um, digital humanities、uh, in Asia,、um, there is no doubt that the momentum is there.、Um, you know, as we all know, the the whole、uh, digital humanities movement is relatively recent. It's relatively new, even, you know, in in North America or even in Europe,、um, and that's、uh, that that piece of history is even shorter in Asia,、uh, probably in the last five or six years、um, altogether.、Uh, but during this short period of time,、um, many many digital humanities have emerged.、Um, projects have emerged. And、uh, people are starting to look at, you know,、um, trying to、um, explore some patterns in the development of digital humanities in Asia, in, in you know, in that particular region, and how、um, they can、um, sustain these these efforts, these projects.、Um, one of the areas, as you, <clears throat> as you know,、uh, what that we discuss in the book. Uh, is the、uh, mushrooming of digital humanities、uh, associations?、Uh, these kinds of、uh, groups, professional groups, have come together,、uh, really sort of positioning themselves as a leader.
in promoting the humanities forward. On the, you know, at the same time, they're um, getting a lot of support from the government. Uh, a lot of government agencies at the different at different levels, you know, for example, in Australia, in Japan, and also in Singapore, uh, they're all getting a lot of support from, um, you know, uh, from the from the various government uh, entities. And we all know that in Taiwan, for example, and even though we didn't include any um, uh, chapters in uh, for mainland China, we all know there is so much um, support from the government uh, in this area as well. So those are you know the, some of the uh, trending uh, phenomena that we have seen uh, in Asia, and this is just the beginning of that. So I think um, you know with this amount of uh, support that they're getting both professional uh, support from organizations, but also uh, funding support from the government. I think this area is gonna um, develop very quickly. Um, They're already starting to look at uh, efforts and programs, how to uh, sustain these efforts. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, I also we also sorry hyper <laughs> okay. Uh, I uh, we also noticed that uh, from our publication that uh, those um, uh, efforts or those projects mostly led by scholars. Uh, sure. Almost all of our authors or contributors uh, they are affiliated with high education institutions. Uh, Library involvement is kind of uh, limited because mostly they are scholar or creator driven, driven right? Uh, so uh, uh, there are some uh, case studies. Uh, I think Haiping probably knows uh, more about it, especially those cases in uh, Hong Kong, Baptist, uh, uh, HV, uh, you know, the university library you worked with, they did some uh, good project that uh, where librarians and uh, uh, faculty members actually collaborated uh, in those uh, uh, projects. That will be a very uh, interesting, very good uh, trends to uh, to to uh, to be looking forward to to be looking forward to actually. Uh, but from what uh, we have seen from the publication, uh, most of those projects are led by scholars, uh, faculty members, and uh, uh, with the potential of the development, we will see, uh, and we want to see more library involvement. Yeah, I think that's, that's quite true. Um, here in the U.S., there is a lot of uh, a pretty strong leadership from the library world in getting involved in these kinds of projects and sponsor these kind of collaborations and partnerships. Uh, in other parts of the world, even you know, say Europe, um, libraries are not involved as much. And in Asia, uh, you know, Min was absolutely right. In most of these. Uh, projects started with scholars, you know, legitimately, you know, those are the ones that create these kind of projects. My experience in Hong Kong was uh, quite interesting because um, um, some of the universities in Hong Kong, there are eight public institutions altogether. Uh, some of the universities started these kinds of projects um, some years back, but um, they really have not uh, viewed it from the sort of digital communities kind of perspective. Um, so when I was at Hong Kong Baptist University, we started this, uh, I kind of repurposed our multimedia uh, resource center into a digital um, services center, which Rebecca was leading. And uh, the main goal of that was to have the library um, uh, you know, being present uh, at tables when discussions of digital humanities or humanities research are in place. And so that was uh, a really good uh, experience 
uh, an example of how libraries could be involved in leading you know, uh, this area of development, uh, particularly um, how, you know, we were having so many discussions about how we would position the library uh, in these kinds of projects. We viewed librarians as <clears throat> collaborators, uh, equal partners um, in these projects. And um, you might wonder what that means. Uh, what that means is that, you know, I kind of see digital humanities as um, a, um, a situation, a, a research project where you need three pillars, right? So you need the content provider, which is the scholar who provides the content. You also need the data manager, um, data curator, and the librarians would play a you know, perfect role in that. You also need uh, IT expertise. Uh, so you will have IT professional there. Um, so in terms of the uh, functional areas, you have these three pillars in place. I think you're pretty good. Um, of course, you know, funding aside, you have to have funding support. Uh, but in terms of the structure for a digital humanities project to move forward, uh, that's what you need. So what we did was um, we tried to collaborate with uh, Campus IT and we were not quite as successful, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, so we kind of um, repurposed this um, de one department in the library with um, digital technological support from the library as well. So we got IT support, we got also got data management support from the library. And then we started working with a, with a professor uh, who was working on a history project. And we ended up, uh, uh, we actually were very successful. The, the, the first project was called History in Data. Um, it, I believe it's still listed on the um, Hong Kong Baptist University Library website, uh, if anyone wants to take a look at that. Um, so that was one of the uh, the first project that we embarked on, and then it got you know started snowballing. Um, other faculty members um, were coming in uh, and request that kind of service. So it was it was a good start. That's a really great point. Uh, what you both said about infrastructure and then getting in um, different stakeholders, which actually I did had a follow up, but I think Min had answered it about the library's involvement. Um, so I think um, there's going to be more for us to cover on this topic. Uh, I want to move on to, oh, actually, we kind of hit on this, the research trends in DH that you're noticing. Um, before I move on to like the next question, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, I think there is a question that came through the chat. Right. Yeah, I would. I think I was going to hold that at the end. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Um, I, I guess a, a research trend, I, I'm wondering whether you've noticed um, any uh, focusing on decolonization uh, in terms of the, the legacies of empires that have been colonizing all the parts of Asia, whether there's any um, DH focus on that uh, region, that kind of topic. Um, in terms of the um, <clears throat> top, top, you know, topics covered uh, in the book, um, I don't think there's anything that's directly related to that, but there are a lot of um, projects that were, <clears throat> you know, for example, historical project that happened during those times. Um, so, um, I'm, I, I don't think any of the chapters directly focused on, on that topic. But I think one of, uh, I, I still, because maybe that chapter made me think a lot more. <laughs> it's not an easy one. As I said earlier, uh, the theoretical uh, paper, it did uh, talk about uh, uh, the cultural influence and everything and the masculine kind of culture uh, on the internet that kind of dictates the policy and make to be very top down uh, kind of approach. And, and uh, that kind of trend and that that you know, people should also watch for. It's not really, uh, it will have different effect for the development. Uh, 
and uh, to create all the projects uh, uh, for digital humanities. But overall, I think uh, the approach is, I, I think most of um, the articles that are submitted, uh, published in the book, I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, the uh, ways they've uh, a lot of similarities. They follow the models uh, what have uh, done in the Western world in terms of the development of digital humanities. Uh, although it's, uh, I would imagine it's hard to avoid any topic of colonization uh, as a cultural uh, historical element, uh, but it's not so uh, evident in the book though. Great, thank you for that. And uh, we could move on to this last question. Um, I think both of you have sort of touched on, on this, uh, Haipong, from your experience um, developing um, funders and creating infrastructure, but um, any sort of support for those who are listening, who are librarians, who are uh, graduate students or um, early career researchers who are interested in DH, exactly wh where should they start? Where, where, what do you suggest more broadly? It doesn't have to be about the book, but you know, whatever you can share. Sure. Um, as you said, you know, we kind of touched on this. I think um, for any digital humanities project, uh, we have heard so much already from uh, faculty, from librarians, and from other researchers who are interested in this, in this area. It's, it's so difficult to start. And the reason being, uh, you know, there, I think there are multiple reasons. Um, it's just, it's a new field that people are not familiar with and they don't, you know, you go and ask, talk to people about digital humanities and people will say, well, what is that? You know, um, so people don't really have a good understanding or much awareness of this field yet. Uh, the other, and, and, and as a result of that, there is not necessarily funding allocated to support projects as such. Now, the encouraging thing um, here for this country, you know, we have so many private foundations that are interested in supporting like Mellon and Sloan Foundation and so on and so forth. Uh, in Asia, most of the funding comes from the government, as I said earlier. But it looks like you know the government is providing more and more of that kind of support. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, actually, uh, the Hong Kong government uh, gave a, a three-year, multi-million dollar funding uh, grant to the Open University of Hong Kong. And Open University of Hong Kong actually is not a public institution. Mm -hmm. It's not one of those eight. Uh, Julek Library, Julek uh, institutions, as, as um, some of you may be familiar with that. Um, so it's a private institution, it's a smaller institution, a less pre prestigious institution. But they got this grant and they established this uh, um, Institute for Digital Culture and Humanities. So um, I actually was invited as their first uh, speaker uh, for the events that they sponsored. That was actually right at the time the Institute was being established. So um, there's a lot of funding that's coming uh, from the government uh, and from the institutions. You know, the institutions also allocate funding um, so um, to support these, these kinds of projects. So in a way, I actually think that uh, this, um, this kind of situation makes digital humanities um, projects much, much more quickly, uh, make them mature more quickly, more sustainable, and um, which is quite different from the situation here in the US. It's, you know, I work with our digital humanities scholars on a regular basis, and it's so difficult for them to get funding support that way. Um, so if funding support is, um, that issue is resolved, then you really need to, uh, the next step is to build the partnership and collaboration that's needed uh, in this process. So, you know, the three pillars, as, as I mentioned earlier, will be critical in 
sort of making sure that the project has its integrity as it moves forward and will be supported um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a needed way. So I, I think those are kinds of things, you know, funding, um, instructor, that's also a part of the structure, um, making sure that you have um, all the funding support, all the um, infrastructure support there and making sure, you know, um, collaboration becomes a key uh, in, in this process. Yeah, I, uh, from the chapters that uh, people contributed, the authors contributed, it, it's uh, one thing is like bottom up. It's easy to start a project. Uh, then the authors and producers, uh, they all talk about how do we sustain it. So that then from bottom up, then you need something also uh, collaboration and also eventually also some uh, top down as well. Top down means uh, the funding support, not just to give the money, give funding that also will also uh, kind of uh, focus the policy issues to support uh, uh, the, uh, the digital humanities as well. Uh, so in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, the faculty or um, scholar driven or creator driven projects, they can all come up. And after that, I think I, I think library should be uh, 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 an active uh, uh, part uh, in the in the whole uh, uh, sustainability kind of uh, efforts um, because each department, in the end, uh, the, the, you know, the the, uh, the 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 projects can come up and then to uh, to share and to have a sustainable uh, access and all these, I think library can uh, play a big part of it. But the gap is that the library has to, librarians should also understand the pedagogical needs of faculty and what it really is uh, uh, the, uh, in the projects that pro uh, the professors are doing, the students can learn uh, and the library can just uh, 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 just be uh, a very, uh, can be instrumental uh, to be in, in, in this part. Another thing is that uh, we noticed the organization, the SIGs on many countries, they all have that. There is a reason for that. Uh, so for instance, uh, the, uh, in Japan, they have SIG, uh, the, I know, the a special interest group for computers and humanities. Uh, they are, uh, they also have a uh, digital humanities association. Uh, uh, you know, Jap Japan is a member and also Taiwanese association for DH and Australian, AADH, Australian, uh, uh, they have also, they, they are all members of Korean association for DH. I think they are all members of uh, uh, the uh, international group, the uh, the. Uh, a A D H O, but those uh, uh, those associations they are actually a hub uh, to connect and energize uh, energize the digital humanities um, communities, and uh, they uh, also uh, provide crowd uh, sourcing and resource sharing opportunities, and also uh, learn from each other to ad uh, to advocate uh, for D H, and also to how to align D H with. Uh, with policy uh, issues, with policies at different levels, and also to stimulate technological uh, innovation. Uh, they, you know, they have a conference and national conference. Uh, those are also very uh, uh, important part in the grassroots um, efforts to, uh, to build uh, digital humanities efforts, including hashtag, right? Uh, yes. bring all <laughs> scholars together. And we should also uh, add some librarians. Well, Ray Pong, you are also a librarian, also a scholar. And so am I. I think I'm very interested in uh, 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 seeing the development uh, to bring technology, research, uh, and scholarship, and teaching, learning all together. So that, that's a great point you, you brought up about the um associations and the groups. And actually that, that responds to uh, one of the questions in the chat box. So Min, I was just gonna ask if you are okay typing it and putting it in the chat box? Cause I know there was a, a couple of them you've listed. Um, 
and I'll let you do that. And in the meantime, I have a, a follow-up for Haipang, which you had mentioned about government um, being a, a provider or funder. And I wonder from what you've seen or, or heard or encountered, whether there has been any topics or areas that may not align with the government's agendas or priorities that may be sensitive, like would not be considered to be uh, funded. Like, were there any um, sort of a, a list of topics in a specific country or whatnot? I say that because obviously um, when government supports something, sponsors something, there's obviously, um, there needs to be a, a, some kind of alignment. You know, you can't be critical of the government per se, if you're mm -hmm. asking for support, right? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Um, this certainly did not come up in the book. Um, you know, <clears throat> these chapters, uh, for example, the chapter um, chapter one um, by a Australian scholar. Uh, the title is "Tracing the Development of Digital Humanities in Australia," and uh, he made it very clear that uh, there was um, a lot of government support uh, in this area. Um, <clears throat> he said uh, between 2005 and 2016, a little over 10 years the government agency called a National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, NCRIS, put in $2.8 billion. Well, these are Australian dollars, <clears throat> but two point billion in a, in a 10 year period, <clears throat> they put in $2.8 billion to support digital humanities. Now, this is unheard of, um, it's just, uh, um, you know, um, there may be, that may be areas that the government uh, are hesitant to support, but certainly that did not come up in the, um, in the chapters of the, um, the various chapters of the book. And we, we keep hearing about sort of censorship and, uh, and things like that. And as Min has mentioned several times, chapter 10, <clears throat> about sort of performing the internet um, you know, there are certainly those issues that are there, um, but in terms of um, areas that the government is not supporting uh, regarding digital humanities, um, it didn't show in, in, in the chapters, in the submissions that we received. That's interesting. So uh, just a follow up from my own experience, uh, for those of you who are familiar with what I've done, I've, I've used to work at New York University, Shanghai, which is part of NYU's uh, global campus. This was like uh, maybe five or six years ago. And one of the focus was looking at um, digital humanities in, in instruction, so for a history class. And the instructor uh, wanted us to support um, her teaching uh, project to ensure that students were able to look at uh, Imperial China using maps, GIS coordinates, and see how China has changed in terms of territory and imperial formations and boundaries. And it was really fascinating. Um, the, but though the, the, the instructor herself was not necessarily um, uh, focused on this area because she could not look at the cultural revolution because um, NYU Shanghai is based in Shanghai, China, People's Republic of China. It's very hard to um, you know, work with that kind of topic even though there's a lot of collections and resources out there. Uh, we had to be really, um, uh, mindful of you know what kind of topics we were going to do and even though there was a lot of exceptions with academic freedom it's still um, something that people were uh, aware of so I, I that's what sort of made me think about um, you know that question and what you had said Hai Peng. Mm -hmm. That's so, certainly a good good point. Yeah so um, Min do you have any other thing you want to add before we jump into the questions? Oh, you might be on mute. Sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm typing right now, so I, I think I'm good. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. And so uh, we have a question here. Uh, this is just more broadly um, two questions. Um, is there an inner Asia cooperation on DH issues already? And 
The other question is, are libraries leading the DH initiatives in Asia or how are researchers involved? So um, uh, Min is actually typing the response, but I'll um, have Haipeng if you want to share some of your thoughts to that question. Sure. Um, in terms of inner Asian cooperation, um, um, I haven't really seen any formal kind of uh, um, mailing list or you know network uh, across Asia, but within each country and and each region, there is certainly a lot of that happening. Um, and these kinds of uh, associations, like um, uh, the Association of Australian uh, Digital Humanities uh, Group, um, they are um, you know they're sponsoring regular conferences and anybody who attends those conferences would be would make it to their mailing mailing list so they are um they have you know these kinds of things going on network and uh i have you know we have seen a lot of uh, digital humanities conferences that are happening in asia um you know in in um, taiwan in mainland china hong kong singapore and so on and so forth so there is a lot of that happening and they are drawing, you know, um, attracting people from all of Asia um, and actually from all over the world. Um, you know, there, there are various levels uh, of um, scopes of these conferences. You know, some are maybe institutional based, others are uh, national organizations sponsoring these conferences. Um, but, you know, more and more of those kinds of things that are happening. So uh, that's one of the reasons um, I'm very encouraged to see this kind of momentum and also this level of interest in this area. Great, thanks for that. And I have um, Min here who has shared in the chat box the variety of um, topics that you can see here. And it's um, focusing on different special interest groups, computers and humanities uh, from Japan, Japanese Association for DH, which is a member of Alliance of DH organization, ADHO. Um, I'm only reading this because I realize the group chats do not actually get recorded. So it's for those who are watching. The Korean Association for DH, uh, DH Humanity Singapore, Although not a formal organization, it was formed by a group of scholars and information science professionals. They have websites and organized conferences and events. Well, thank you, Min, for um, gathering that information. And we will uh, share what Min wrote in the event through a recap of the video later to be shared with all of you. So um, are there any other um, questions? Please feel free to type. And if not, I have another sort of follow up. This is more broadly looking at when do you think in the future anytime soon, will the word digital be removed and it'll just be like part of the humanities <laughs> curriculum? That, that's an <clears throat> interesting and a good question. And uh, this would be for the scholars to decide. Um, if you recall this, the development of this uh, digital, human, digital humanities, even in this country, in the US, the Modern Language Association is the place where a lot of these debates these conversations are happening. When digital humanities was first um, discussed in MLA, scholars were arguing whether it was a discipline, whether it was just simply a met pedagogy, a methodology, or what. You know, people were having those kinds of kinds of discussions and debates, and they never reached a conclusion. <laughs> it's like when I studied educational technology leadership, people say, what is educational technology? So, uh, but uh, I think uh, many people, I also believe that uh, technology, uh, technology is there actually, uh, technology is really uh, the means, not the ends. But at a given time right now, uh, it is, uh, is a driving force to take humanity studies forward. And also the use of technology really stimulate more technology, uh, technological uh, innovation. So they are really connected uh, to work together. 
but the content area is just to uh, the goal and the purpose is to move forward uh, the scholarship in humanities. I don't see the com uh, the computers uh, technologies can digital can be uh, removed, but I yeah. think the core of this uh, uh, DH it should be on the content area, which is the community studies. So just to follow up on that, um, in terms of uh, both of you have mentioned um, scholars have are the ones who initiate uh, DH projects or research trends in the area. Are they in, in the universities in Asia, are they in higher education? Are they considered part of their tenure file? Do you know? Is it part of that? It's very contested here in the US, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I wonder if you have any context for that. Well, I think if you, um, if the outcome of your project is, you know, is per perceived or viewed as a form of publication, certainly, you know, it's just like any other publication that would be counted towards your, um, you know, tenure, your promotion and things like that. Uh, I'm not sure about the creative arts piece, uh, how that's viewed. And that has been a debate. Um, it doesn't matter where, you know, here in North America or Asia or Europe, uh, that's you know always um, a, a question in terms of how you know uh, that that whole area of research or creativity <clears throat> that you know all of that um, it's it's really hard to uh, pinpoint. It's hard to define. You know what 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 would be counted for towards tenure or promotion promotion and things like that. So I would I, say, so I would say, <clears throat> even here, you know, a lot of these projects are not counted towards that. As as you said, as you mentioned, Ray, uh, it's very contested, um, and and this is true in uh, Asia as well. But I think they look at sort of the outcome. If if it does become sort of some form of publication, uh, you know, in a journal, you know you know, whether in a journal or in a, uh, in a book form, then it will be included. It's interesting. I just haven't seen a lot of uh, publications in English language about Asian Pacific, uh, the development in Asian Pacific uh, region, actually. That's why I, I, I was very interested in uh, being part of this publication. However, I do know uh, there are many, many projects going on in many countries, uh, in many countries in Asia. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of, uh, there are many areas that still haven't uh, been touched. And, uh, you know, there are many things to be debated, not just the technology and content, and then uh, the ownership, and then uh, a lot of things that people just still don't even want to touch some of the topic yet. It's just like we haven't uh, haven't figured out really what it is and then we just still, still want to keep doing it, but without uh, settling down the dust yet. That's a great point. So in case their projects may not be accepted, at least their chapters are, right? Since they have a chapter in your book about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, I so there's a sort of a follow-up question. This will be the last one. Um, how can we share information on best practices in DH for Asian studies tools in the future, and especially build the bridge between knowledge, which is there in the area, and research in Europe, US, and UK? So this is a, a, a big question. And uh, that's one. The second question is, are you coming to ADHO, DH 2019, in uh, Netherlands? I can never pronounce that city, but you know, that's a yes and then, no. And, uh, <laughs> when is it? I am going there for an IFLA, uh, IFLA meeting, but uh, oh. I, yeah, I will be there for, uh, for a meeting actually in The Hague. Yeah, I, I won't be able to attend that because of my schedule, but I want to respond mm -hmm. to the question about the, um, what was the, the first question? Um, right, how do we bridge the tools how, and how practices? Do we share, yeah. How do we share that information? I think as scholars and as librarians even, you know, uh, anyone who's involved in these kinds of projects, you know, attend conferences, uh, presenting and sharing, you know, whatever opportunities are there 
um, let people know how you are doing your digital humanities project. And also, you know, take these opportunities as learning opportunities, you know, how other people are doing it. So people learn from each other. So, um, you know, on these platforms. Um, and there may be other ways, you know, through uh, sort of, uh, you know, informal gatherings, um, you know, even um, online um, workshops and chats and things like that. So, you know, do whatever you can you, um, to share. I think that would be the most important. Otherwise, people won't know what you're doing. Great. So thank you very much. We are out of time. Uh, I really please join me to thank Hai Pong and Min for just sharing their knowledge and expertise with us and really appreciate the time that they spent um, just chatting and um, really like to thank Haystack um, for helping us facilitate. And it's Friday, so happy Friday to all of you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ray, uh, Min, and Hai Peng. This uh, webinar has been recorded, so we are going to post the recording and we'll also have an event recap. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great Friday. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a good Friday. <laughs>